Okay, I'm, I'm Glenn Gamboa. I'm the philanthropy editor at the Associated Press. And I'm excited to welcome you all to this conversation. It's part of a partnership that we at the AP have with the Chronicle of Philanthropy and the conversation to help the public better understand how philanthropy works and what it achieves. I want to give some thanks to the, uh, the Lilly Endowment for providing support for this effort and for enabling us to do more discussions just like this one. Uh, so first, uh, a little housekeeping. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions for this great panel. Uh, we'll try to have some time for that at the end. Uh, there's a lot of them and they have a lot to say. But um, so if you could please type them into the Q&A section and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, today we're here for crisis in Ukraine and beyond, how you can help now and over the long run. And we have a panel who has tackled this issue from a variety of approaches uh, from the front lines, from studying it. Uh, and I have the honor of introducing our moderator today. Uh, Catesby Holmes is a fellow at Harvard University Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. Uh, there she serves as the deputy editor of the Media Manipulation Casebook, which publishes deep dive investigations into online disinformation campaigns. She's also worked at the Open Society Foundations and as a freelance reporter frequently covering global news. She was a 2020 International Woman in Media Foundation Reporting Fellow, and her work has been published in Bloomberg, Slate, and Wired, among other outlets. Um, Catesby, you've been covering this Ukraine-Russia conflict for years. Can you start us off with some context as to how it has come to this? Sure, and I should add that um, I covered it primarily at the conversation where I was the international editor before joining the Shorenstein um, Center. So this is kind of like a homecoming for me to be here at this event that's jointly hosted by the conversation. It's nice to be back. And yeah, I think the main thing to remember is that this is not a new war. The war began in 2014 with the invasion of Crimea. Um, and, and that conflict killed 12,000 to 14,000 people estimated. So this has been going on for a long time. It's just entered a deadlier new phase with a full invasion that was launched earlier this year. And some of our panelists have been working in Ukraine for many years now um, and know the scene on the ground well as it built up to the current crisis. Others, um, you know, have a different approach to the crisis, have come in more, more recently. And I'm really excited to talk to everybody about how people can help. There is so much interest uh, from Americans and people worldwide to support the fight in Ukraine and the people in Ukraine and the refugees. So um, I want to introduce our panelists. I know that you guys have a lot to say. I want to get right to it. We will hear from Sandrina de Cruz, who's the Director of Disaster Response at Global Giving, which supports nonprofits and charities worldwide. Beth Gaisley, Professor of Public Affairs at Indiana University Bloomington, who recently wrote for the conversation about how to help in Ukraine, a very widely read article. Um, Patty McElreevy, who is president and CEO of the Center for Disaster Philanthropy, which guides philanthropy toward disaster, giving and disasters of uh, all sorts. Nate Mook, CEO of World Central Kitchen, which is the emergency food provider um, of Chef Jose Andres that does emergency food provisions worldwide, including in Ukraine. And we have Art Taylor, president and CEO of give.org, which monitors charities to ensure they are trustworthy and provides information about charitable, give, uh, charitable giving people. And last but not least, Thomas Teig, president and CEO of the medical NGO Direct Relief, which has been working in Ukraine for years and has entered a new phase of its engagement around providing medical material to people and hospitals on the ground in Ukraine. So thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, since we do have a bounteous panel with six of you, uh, I am going to try to speak to everybody on multiple occasions. I'm going to ask you to keep your, your answers short so that everybody gets a chance to speak. And we're going to try to do this more in a conversation style, no pun intended, um, more, more than as a Q&A. So I, I, you know, I'm going to sort of ping people, but please join in if you have something to say. We, we want to get lots of voices and perspectives here. Uh, so first question is for Beth, Patty, and Thomas. Uh, the scale of description in Ukraine makes it clear that this, um, the need on the ground is going to go on for a long time, not just now and not just tomorrow, but for many years to come. Um, we know media attention will turn away long before that. And we have some data showing that American money will also tend to be diverted well before that. 
Um, I wonder if we could show the slides that show when Americans give and how much. So I, I'd like the panelists, the three of you that I mentioned, or everybody to take a look at this. You can see how the amount of money um, rises really quickly in the beginning after the uh, first two weeks, four weeks, up to six weeks of um, after a disaster. And then in many cases, the amount tends to level off. And what the leveling off means is that not much more money is going towards crises. There are a couple examples um, that are exceptions. Hurricane Katrina is a notable exception where money kept coming in. Um, here we have uh, amounts, like where do US charities give? Again, like Hurricane Katrina, this is a domestic crisis. We can see that the amount that Americans give is much higher for domestic crises, and it tends to be much lower for international crises. Um, I can see that the typhoon in the Philippines was, was by far the least, even though the scale of destruction may have been greater than Hurricane Katrina. So um, Beth, let's start with you. Does this data reflect your experience looking at how Americans give? Um, yes, I think it does, Catesby, um, but a couple of points. First, these figures mainly focus on natural disasters. Ukraine, as you mentioned, is still in the middle of a military invasion on top of an eight-year civil war, and we don't know the outcome. We have to be realistic, um, but we do know this is still a disaster on an unprecedented scale, both in terms of the amount of physical destruction as well as the number of displaced people. So far, Americans appear to be giving on the same grand scale at percentages similar to Katrina or 9-11, where half or more of Americans made a contribution. And I'm hopeful that those facts and the political commitment our country is making to Ukraine keeps the crisis in the media and in the public eye longer than eight weeks. Um, second point, the, this disaster is going to require a multi-generational response. You hear this phrase a lot in emergency management, disaster, your recovery is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, if Ukraine prevails, we're talking about rebuilding a nation that's being bombed to bits, rebuilding everything from universities to hospitals to homes, cultural sites. If Ukraine falls, we're talking about supporting millions of displaced people who may be becoming permanent asylum seekers. So one of the typical pieces of advice for donors who really do want to support these um, crises long term is to consider splitting your gift, designating some of it for immediate relief aid, and then the remainder for longer emerging and longer term needs. Thanks, Patty and Tom. Anything to add to that? Yeah, if I may, I, I think, um, thank you, Catesby, for having us here. And, and I think Beth really outlined it very well. I mean, the, the challenge is people give for three reasons. They give proximity, scale, and media. And complex humanitarian emergencies have always been a challenge, um, you know, because it has always been exactly, as Beth said, very complicated. When is the end? When do I give? How do I give? And as CDP Candid, our own research has shown, complementing um, you know, the universities, the vast majority of giving, even to those disasters that we highlighted, you know, it, it's, it's for that immediate, only 6% goes to response and recovery. So it's even, it's even more desperate than you would hope. It's, not, it's, it's really a very small amount that goes into those response and recovery in, and, and towards reconstruction. And I think the challenge we have in some ways over this is the narrative we have about recovery because it's seen as this timeline, something we do later. And I, I respectfully disagree that with that because it, it's a lot about it. A lot of recovery is about the approach we take. If we want to have a really strong, equitable, localized recovery, we need to explore how to support those organizations as close as possible on the ground, as soon as possible on the ground. And by the, the you know, what I mean by it's a, an approach, not a time, you, this is an example. It's the difference between a warm meal and temporary shelter, critically important when you first crossed a border, or when you're in the midst of a crisis. But what everyone truly wants in a disaster is as soon as possible to have a home filled with a pantry full of food that they can cook their own meal. That's about giving people recovery, the hope of a future, an agency in their, in what they wish to do, how they wish to recover, where they wish to go. And that's what we need to try and, and educate ourselves, the public, the communities about more and more is listening to Ukrainians on the ground and saying, what do you really need and how do we get it to you? How do we explore that? Giving them the power of choice 
the agency of that decision making of their future. The sooner we can do that, the better. Tom, if you could chime in. Well, I agree. I mean, I think we've, in that uh, chart you showed, directly is still working in each one of those events um, from Katrina on with many of the same people we were working with at the time. Um, and Ukraine, we've, as you mentioned, we've been working and will continue to. So I, I think that the dilemma is really um, not on the part of the people who are giving. I mean, they're, they're doing an extraordinarily generous thing personally. And I think the dilemma comes on the part of those of us who receive it, what is the responsible thing to do? How much do you lean in now? I think we've been talking about that here and we've said, we're not gonna hold anything back. I mean, that's insulting to people in Ukraine for whose benefit direct relief relieve money. And so we've organized around, um, if you have a clean shot, you take it, you do it thoughtfully. You work with local people who have a, you know, the, the strongest vested interest in how this shakes out and you do it with respect. So. I think it's so early right now. I think these general trends of, um, you know, Americans have a short attention span. There's always something pulling for our attention. So it's been extraordinary how intensely covered it has been through, from all the, uh, the major outlets. Uh, but at some point, I think it reaches a saturation point and people just can't absorb anymore. So I think I understand it. I, it's just something we all have to deal with. But I think to keep an eye on the long term as, as, um, both Patty and Beth said, of, of course, I think what that means in terms of our day-to-day -day activity is strengthening the local institution. Who's going to be there in five years? Which institutions, which organizations? And try to make sure that with the money um, and resources that are being provided to nonprofits, that it keeps that in mind. You know, move as fast as you can, but with an eye on the long term and who's going to be there in the next five years and listen carefully. And that's what we try to do here. So the three of you who just responded, follow-up question here. Um, I remember an article in the conversation several years ago, and I can't remember exactly which, um, which crisis it was in response to, but the headline was something like, want to help in, let's say, Houston. Maybe you should just wait a little while. And the, the thrust of the article was that people, people give in the beginning, right? And then they kind of forget. And in many cases, a lot of the need um, can arise much later. And so if you want to give, one of the most helpful ways to do it is to wait. Would you guys recommend that advice in regards to Ukraine, or would you recommend something more like um, scheduled giving, long-term giving? How should people handle the now versus the later? I think it really varies depending on the individual, the organization, how much money they have. I mean, there, I, I don't think there's any one perfect solution that's out there. It's what aligns to your values, what aligns to your own mission as an individual, as a family, as an organization. And I always say, you know, if you can give, give, set up a sustainable gift, set up monthly giving. You've already, or, you've already decided what organization you want to help. Trust them to know when to do it. They don't need you. If, if, if you've done your research, that organization doesn't need to tell you when to start recovery, when to start different approaches. They already know. What they need to know is this, that they have, they have confidence that the funding is coming. And whether that's through a one-time gift at the beginning or whether that's through a sustaining gift into general operations or unrestricted to allow them to be flexible to the needs on the ground, that, that for me is always the best way to help. You do your research, you find the organization, and you trust them to do what they need to do. I would Honestly. agree, yeah. absolutely, 100%. Um, and and when I mentioned splitting gifts, I wasn't talking about withholding support. I was, talk I was talking about making a long-term commitment. Um, one of the things that comes out of disaster research is that we, we understand the need to build a strong infrastructure. And so we're not only helping people meet their day-to-day -day needs, but we're also building resilient um, long-term capacity to help people in the future. And you'd be amazed at how much the budgets of, you know, everything from the Red Cross to some of the people representing institutions here, their budgets go up and down because people do have short-term memories when it comes to giving. That's not good for um, disaster recovery organizations. So the, the kind of long-term giving that Patty's talking about is really essential, but it's also built on this idea that we build relationships with organizations. And um, if we trust them to make an impact, then we, we have to trust them to do that over time and give them the capacity to do that. Thanks, we have about 30 seconds left, Thomas, if there's anything you'd like to add there. Well, I, mean, I, th 
I, I agree with what the other speaker said. I, I think it's, um, you know, nonprofits, you have to understand the role we're playing. I think we're public government-like and that we're, exists for the public benefit, but we're supposed to be more nimble. We should move fast to emergencies. We shouldn't hold back. And I think recognize that the big reconstruction, no nonprofit organization is, is gonna have enough. We're talking about hundreds of facilities damaged and to the extent a group is going to be engaged in that long term, earn it now with the money you've got, communicate it well, show what you're doing, explain why. And I think that should take care of itself. But that's why you have governments and IMF. I think those big wheels, sometimes they go far, but they're slow to get turning. And I think the role that organizations can play is moving fast and doing it thoughtfully and understanding the role that they're playing and the role that they're not. That's a, a great segue for the next question I had. Um, and this next question is for Sandrina, Art, and Nate. What we've seen in this conflict in particular is like social media direct calls for funding to specific people or specific organizations. And you know, you can use PayPal or you can use GoFundMe. Um, there was even the use of Airbnb to give money to individual families in Ukraine. For those who weren't following, people would book Airbnbs in Ukrainian cities that they were never planning on using. Airbnb waived its fee at a certain point because there was some, <laughs> some um, pushback about Airbnb taking a fee. And this was seen as a way to sort of cut the red tape and get money directly from people who want to help to the people who are on the ground, who need help and who know best how to use that money. Um, I'm wondering how those of you, again, Sandrina, Art, Nate, you know, how do you balance the, the um, big organizations that have the experience on the ground and as our, as our panelists said, know best how to use the money with some people's desire to give straight to the individuals themselves? Maybe Sandrina, you wanna start? Sure, I can kick us off. So we advocate for supporting an ecosystem of humanitarian response organizations, um, but most importantly, we advocate for prioritizing local experts um, and local organizations that are closest to the crisis. They're most intimately familiar with um, the complex issues and the needs as they're arising on the ground and as they're shifting on the ground as well. And for this particular case, you know, we're talking about in Ukraine, but also in Poland, Romania, Slovakia, um, and, and other areas as well. Um, and so the idea here is that these local teams are going to be able to support their communities long after the crisis um, is no longer making the headlines. And we often hear, because global giving responds to um, crisis, humanitarian crisis and natural disasters all over the world, and we often hear from these communities that their voices are not heard in the disaster response. And so our experience is that giving to vetted, trusted local organizations helps to strengthen the short-term support and the long-term recovery needs. And I would say that um, my next recommendation has to do with um, giving recurring donations, which we touched on um, a little bit and sort of having this longer term commitment, especially for local organizations that can establish um, these trusting relationships with their communities. And as we know that the recovery process takes decades, that's extremely important. And it's also beneficial to some extent um, because organizations uh, to one um, extent or another, they provide uh, updates. And so you can keep up with what's going on in that particular location and develop that sort of um, awareness as well as to what's going on in those communities. Um, and then I think it's really important to emphasize, um, especially in times of crisis, uh, to give cash um, rather than in-kind donations and uh, understanding that we feel very compelled to give as we see people um, that might be cold, that want food and we wanna give coats and, and canned goods and, and the like, but it's important that we keep in mind that um, giving cash enables uh, those organizations to be able to make decisions in real time as to what the needs are, how they can support the people that are coming in through those doors. It also helps to stimulate the local economy as we're seeing um, is, is starting to be um, a critical issue in Ukraine. And then the unfortunate reality is as well that um, when it comes to in-kind donations, sometimes teams are literally sifting through tons um, of donations. And so rather than actually delivering that um, direct support um, to Ukrainians that need it, um, they're having to be you know, in the back in a warehouse having to organize all those donations. Thanks, Sandrina. Um, Art, so your organization monitors charities, right? And you try to keep track of who's doing the best getting the money where it's going, who can who can people trust? So I'm interested in, in your response to the question of, you know, how can people best give? How can they best know 
that the money is getting where it is meant to be. Presumably, people want it to get to people, you know, yeah. and, and not to other causes that a, a nonprofit may decide are, are important and, and that the people may, it may be important, but, you know, I think the donor desire is, an is in an interesting tension with what the broader scene may be on the ground as well. Yeah. Well, I think that we've learned many years ago that it's really important for charitable organizations to be clear upfront about what they intend to do. Because we also know that at the end of it, there is an accounting that comes. And the media will want to know, well, what actually happened with all of this money that was raised? And I think every charity should seek to be in a position of saying, we tried to do exactly what we said we would do with the money. If you go back and read our appeals, if you go back and check our website for what we said we would do, that's exactly what we did. And when we couldn't do that, we let everyone know that we were shifting what we planned to do and for the reasons that they were willing to do it. So keeping the public informed about not only what you want to do up front, but what you're currently doing with those resources will go a long way in making sure that uh, the organization is in a position to help next time because it's coming as well. The other thing, though, in, in terms of donors, the first thing people want to know is where to give. And, you know, there's usually a mad rush to figure out which organizations are actually out there doing something. And what we've seen is that there are people out there, as well as organizations trying to help people. But there are also institutions that are collecting funds to help in different ways. I, I know that the Humane Society is actually collecting money to to help with animals. And there are other organizations that are probably working to do infrastructure type things. And so, you know, people don't often know right away which organizations to go to or even what type of help is being offered. And I think it, what we try to do in our organization is quickly try to get those vetted charities out there on our website so that people can see who's doing what and, and, and why. And we're also offering the continuing advice to organizations to be really clear about what they're doing so that in the end, there is uh, less confusion about what happened to the money. Because the work is really difficult. It's not work that an organization can stand up and say, we guarantee that we're going to get these kinds of outcomes. And we need to be very humble about what we say we're going to do and not simply promise things that we can't deliver just to draw funds. The last thing I'll say is that when you think about um, the needs of people in a particular crisis, and it has been said many times, it goes on from the continuum of, we need immediate help to just eat and have shelter and clothing to getting support longer term for actually rebuilding those pantries, as has been said, and, and furthermore, further on. I think organizations have to decide how far into that they're going to go and how far um, realistically should they go? Because there comes a point at which, as Tom pointed out, charities aren't really equipped to rebuild countries. That has to take a much larger, I think, uh, uh, global sort of support than most organizations are willing to uh, and able to provide. Now, last thing, I promise I'll be quiet. The, the whole question about um, should we fund organizations versus individuals? Well, if you can find people who are standing up and saying, I need help, and there's a way to give to them, I can certainly understand a person saying, I'm going to do that. But I also say to people, if you're interested in assuring that the response is sustained and that this person that you were wanting to help today gets help further down the road, you might also want to consider organizations because they're the only ones in a position to, to do sustained kinds of activities that can help more people over a longer period of time. Thanks, Art. That's, a, that's an interesting um, point to put on it. Yeah. Again, coming back to the immediate versus long-term nature yeah. of crises, right? Um, Nate, as far as organizations on the ground doing the work, um, you lead one of them, World Central Kitchen. Um, what's your take on this of how, to, how best to help people there? 
Yeah, you know, I, I think it's actually a pretty great thing to see the desire and so much outpouring of support for the Ukrainian people and, you know, even all the GoFundMes and the PayPals and the things like that, because I think it's it's indicative of a trend, which is a healthy one, in which donors really want to know where their money's going, right? And I think for a long time, and we're, we're seeing this trend shifting away, but for a long time, you know, people have donated to kind of a, a black box and they hope that organizations will use their funds wisely. And maybe the organizations will claim to use their funds wisely. And then in the end, we find out that's not always the case. And so I think there is a push for a lot more radical transparency in this space, which is, which is very, very healthy and important. Um, the technology is here today that, you know, we should have this, um, you know, for our work right now in, in Ukraine, for example, we're serving anywhere between 300 and 400,000 meals a day. We're moving millions of pounds of food uh, via trucks and trains across the country. We have thousands of distribution points every single day. Um, and all of this data is tracked in real time or nearly real time. Some of our partners don't have reliable connectivity. And so we're able to provide donors with, you know, maps showing, you know, that they can browse through and click on things and see literally what happened this day. So where is their money being used? And I think that type of connectivity and interaction with a donor base is going to be ever more critical as we move forward and, and really with the technology and the tools we have today, there's really no excuse not to, not to have that type of real-time data. So I think, you know, in terms of donors giving to Ukraine, it's totally understandable that people wanna to give to something very specific. Cause it's like, if I give money to this person in this GoFundMe, it seems like they're gonna use it for this specific purpose. But as Art said, you know, that doesn't necessarily scale. And so any sort of bigger giving needs to really go through a trusted organization that's doing the work on the ground. I think specifically for Ukraine, what you're seeing is, is a couple of different areas of need. You have the displaced refugee populations that have left Ukraine, um, that have very specific needs around you know, relocation, housing, long-term support around, you know, jobs and essentially rebuilding their lives, at least for the short term and potentially for the long term. And I think there are a lot of ways, there are a lot of incredible organizations doing work with those refugee populations in many different ways. There's right on the border as people are leaving, there's some of the longer term support that's been discussed and um, you have amazing work being done across the board. And so, you know, kind of identifying some of that if that isn't an area of interest. And then there's the needs within Ukraine right now. So populations that are cut off from access to humanitarian aid and need assistance immediately. So these are, you know, these are folks that need food, water, or, or other, other goods, other items, you know, right now. And so there's really, and you know, there are really only a handful of organizations that are working within Ukraine due to the security situation, especially as you get over to the eastern side of Ukraine, where the need is so acute. And so, um, you know, I think it's, it's important to really look at the type of kind of assistance that donors are looking to provide or most um, enthusiastic to support and then kind of direct that to the different types of organizations that are able to meet the need and especially for a situation so complex and moving so rapidly as as Ukraine is but um, you know, I think donors are pretty savvy these days. People are pretty, you know, in tune of, of where they're giving and how they're giving. And so I, I'm hopeful and optimistic that, you know, they're making all of us better. I know they're making World Central Kitchen better um, with our work because, you know, they demand it. And that sort of real-time transparency is, is so, so important. Sandrina, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I wanted to add a little bit to to what Nate said, um, and I agree with the the points that that he's made, and certainly seeing that appetite on the part of donors to um, you know do the research, to want to know more about what's going on, and also bring in um, the important component that um, local organizations within Ukraine, um, and a lot of cases like they have no choice but to operate in these really insecure environments. And what we're hearing from a lot of the global giving um, partners, nonprofit organizations in Ukraine is that they're having to work through um, a lot of volunteers. I mean, in some cases, yes, some of their staff were able to leave the country, but a lot of them have decided to stay and to provide the support that they can. 
Um, and also wanting to, to compliment a little bit of what um, Art said earlier. Um, and again, you know, fully agreeing with, you know, the, the, the need to, to do this type of um, review and, and try and ensure that, you know, organizations are transparent. Uh, but when it comes to the long-term recovery process in certain contexts, it is actually those charities within those countries that are leading the way. And so, you know, we are still working with local nonprofits um, in Puerto Rico that are helping to reestablish uh, the critical water infrastructure after Hurricane Maria. And so, yes, it is true. They work um, in collaboration sometimes with the government, um, but I'm thinking even here uh, or in Venezuela rather, um, nonprofit organizations that are um, trying to build back the medical system as well. Um, I want to pause here with this best, you know, ways where people can actually help to talk about volunteerism for a moment. Um, Nate, I believe uh, 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 many of the people working for you are volunteers. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a combination. Um, we, you know, I think as uh, Sandrina was saying, you know, the it's so important to build local infrastructure and support the local groups and organizations. So on the ground in Ukraine, we have uh, local staff that we've built up and hired along with sort of an army of, of volunteers and also folks that work for many of the restaurants. We have about 350 restaurants currently active in Ukraine right now cooking every day. So those staff are also being paid. So it's a combination of paying local staff because I definitely don't want to be reliant or, or encourage free, free labor, but also at the same time, you know, volunteers play a really critical role, especially in and around Ukraine. I mean, we're seeing this, we saw this outpouring of support of volunteers uh, on the border sites, you know, people flooding from all over Europe, certainly in Poland and Romania and Moldova and Hungary and Slovakia, and all of these amazing people that were coming in to support the refugees that were that were streaming into their countries. And within Ukraine, you know, people are doing amazing work on their own, not getting paid for it or separate from their day jobs. Um, and it really, really is a critical way to also build up that local capacity, right? We don't want to come in and, you know, kind of bringing a bunch of stuff from the outside and tell people what to do. Really, it's about going in and, and activating the resources that are already there on the ground to be fast and efficient and really helping that coordination, which we have the experience with, but really leveraging the local groups, the local organizations that, that can do it so well. So volunteers, I think, across the board are so important to many of the nonprofits that are working. And then also, as Sandrina said, partnering with the local organizations and the groups that are still there and will be there for the long term. Tom, Thomas, sorry, I've been giving you a nickname that it's not mine to give. <laughs> Thomas, um, you, does, does Nate's experience um, reflect what you've been in Poland, correct? Are you also seeing this combination of paid staff and volunteers? And then I want to I want to ask the question, is volunteering a good way for people to help? Would you guys recommend volunteering? I think our experience with uh, direct relief is we're like most organizations are support organizations. Not, I mean, it's being driven by local people and should be. Um, I think, you know, our, our equivalent, I think, to what Nate described is that I'm sort of unusual, but there was a private multi-level skill hospital in Kiev that converted to a free hospital because there was no income. So we agreed to pay the staff of 300 people, just pick it up. So there's there are free services for people who, who can encounter serious injury. So, um, and they're providing a public benefit service right now, but their character was private. So, you know, nonprofit, we nonprofit groups are, uh, have weird descriptors. You know, we talk like, well, what sector are you in? I'm in the agriculture sector, the food sector, the health sector. And I think pretty much every person on this planet is a member of every sector. So I think the dilemma in a big emergency is like the groups are thinking in terms of what they're focused on skill, recognizing there are a lot of other things like Art said, people really care about animals. And that's a wonderful thing to do. And I think, you know, to recognize that no one group can do it all and um, or should try, but to really be you know, lean into it, engage the people who are there and try to sustain for the long term with whatever philanthropic funds come in. Keep your eye on the long game because you can, you know, quick victory that has a long term bad outcome is not good if you displace people who, whether it's in a restaurant or a hospital, I think that's not the desire or, or the productive use. So I think. This is different too. I, I would just say that um, volunteers in a war zone is different than volunteers in, in another type of environment, a cleanup after a natural disaster, for sure. There's high personal risk and there's, uh, it's worth considering carefully. Um, in Europe, I think there's been a wonderful outpouring. What we've seen in Poland 
is again, trying to work and leverage what's there. And I think $10 million to backstop the co-payment for refugees so that they can go in from Ukraine, they're covered by the national health insurance, but which requires a little co-payment if you need a medication. So we agreed to work with a company that can do person-specific tracking and backstop the co-payment, um, which is narrow and focused, but it's easy to explain. It's very highly trackable. So there's integrity in that process, but it involves working with a private business who we all want to make sure don't have that ripple effect consequence and suffer because, again, the, the problems are big enough. The ripple effect is huge. And just to understand the role, what's the highest and best use of this philanthropic money that does what people want, honors their intention, but also has a catalytic effect now and in the future. If I may, Kate, speak, come in. Um, I, I, I think it's great, the volunteers and the outpouring that's there. Um, I think Thomas spoke a little bit about the responsibility in, in volunteerism. You don't want to be a burden to organizations. I would say for organizations that are, are, are using Ukrainians as volunteers, especially those national organizations that, that need our support in a, in a big way, so, in the same way we don't, we fight against the inequities of not paying your interns, we, we should really be challenging ourselves about not paying Ukrainians. They are straining their coping mechanisms right now. We ha Yes, the outpouring is there, but we have to help them. And we have to figure out how to make that happen. And I know that's challenging in a lot of ways right now, but we've got, we've got to make sure that funding is getting as much as possible to, to Ukrainians, um, to, to individuals, to families, especially those who are helping um, at the front lines of, of this crisis. If I may just quickly though on the accountability and transparency, because I've heard a lot of comments about that. And I, I think it's wonderful. There's an ecosystem. We all recognize the value civil society plays, governments plays. We all have a role in, in the recovery and reconstruction. And even let's be honest in the current response needs for um, Ukraine, you know, the, it, it, it's incredibly important. But I wanna, I wanna just manage expectations, knowing this is a call to the public, to the American public, this conversation manage your expectations. You do not want the organization to be looking at you in the response. You don't center yourself in the response. The res they need to be focused on the Ukrainians and the work that they're doing. And if the expectation is lots of reports, lots of communication, lots of feedback, it takes a lot of money to do that. And it pulls money from the response. I'm not saying it's an all or nothing by any means. Of course, it's a balance. But I just want to manage expectations that organizations on the ground, they need to be nimble. They need to be flexible. They need to be able to manage and adjust and adapt on the fly. And if they know that they've got to go back and ask your permission before they do that, it's going to hinder their ability to be as responsive as they need. You've heard from Nate, you've heard from Thomas, their programs have probably shifted half a dozen times just in the last week and a half. They need to have that flexibility and you need to give it to them and not expect too much demand back in terms of how they report back to you. So I just wanted to highlight that. I really wanna put an appeal out there for the organizations on the ground, give them your trust, expect yes, but not too much. So you're saying there's a tension between accountability and transparency, which is what people as donors crave, and the nimbleness that we've heard emphasized repeatedly here that organizations need on the ground in order to be able to respond. And the overhead. And, and, and you want low overhead, so don't put too much expectation on things that will cost them to do that's actually for you and not for the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I know that Nate has to leave us in a few minutes, and I just before he does, uh, have the question start with him, but then we can talk with other folks here. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that this conversation is about Ukraine, which is experiencing a full-scale war at this moment. It is not the only place in the world that is experiencing war or hunger or displacement. Um, and as we saw from the slides in the beginning, Americans tend uh, most often to give to domestic crises, right? And then after that, it drops off pretty substantially. So I would just ask, uh, starting with Nate, because I know you have to go and I know your organization is working in many different places. Where else should people who want to help be paying attention to right now? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there, there, there's a lot going on. And, and, you know, as we enter hurricane season in the next month or so, you know, that'll um, continue to, to get worse. Um, you know, recently there was a uh, cyclones hitting Madagascar, where our team was, there's flooding in South Africa, obviously ongoing issues in places like Yemen and Syria. 
Um, you know, there's a constant refugee crisis going on on the southern border of the United States right now. There's a big wildfire in New Mexico where our teams are on the ground right now as well. I mean, you know, unfortunately, there is no shortage of places to help. And, and as you said, um, you know, Ukraine is, has a lot of the world's attention, rightly so. You know, it's the, the fastest refugee crisis we've seen um, perhaps ever. Um, you know, we're looking at the potential for, uh, you know, a, a massive shift in in what's happening in in the world and overall with with the this you know this invasion and and what it means for Europe and for the United States and for the world itself and so of course there is a lot of attention on this and so you know hopefully this can be a way to catalyze you know support from uh, the public and also to to use this moment to talk about some of the other things that are going on as well. So I, I don't think it ever has to be an either or. And sometimes it's up to organizations like ours to help share. You know, use this moment to say, "Here's what we're doing in Ukraine with your support," and we're also doing these other things that you might want to know about. So it brings more people sort of into the house, so to speak, and and hopefully can be an opportunity to educate folks on on what else might be going on. But you know, people, people have busy lives, they have their own lives, you can't expect them to, to track everything. So, you know, we try to do our best. Um, but there's certainly a lot of places that, you know, that that certainly need our help. I think a good way to look at it, our, our founder, Chef Jose Andres talks a lot about longer tables. And I think creating opportunities for people to be part of that and, and to learn more and, and to, you know, join an organization or support an organization, not necessarily for a one-off disaster response, which might be their way, their, their entry into the work itself, but then to share and, you know, and build those longer tables that, that connect all of us together. So um, just, just one way to look at it. Thanks. Beth, if you had to um, make a, make a case for broader giving or more global giving, what would be your, your case to make? I know you study civil society, so I'm interested in particular about places where you've seen maybe a civil society response that could, that could use a boost. Well, effective and long-term giving is really about donors building relationships with the places they're supporting, the people they're supporting. So I am, I'm not going to presume to talk about one part of the world over another part of the world, but what I would say is that um, the organizations I favor are organizations that are really transparent and open about what they need. There's a famous story about uh, Doctors Without Borders, which is an organization I really respect. Um, after the um, 2004 tsunami sent out a public notice to its donors, thanking them for their support of East Asian giving, but telling them that there were other crises in other parts of the world that required medical response. And at this point forward, donations would go to those other places. Well, of course they got pushback, um, right? But, but they, they, they hopefully also educated a number of donors along the way about um, trusting charities to understand where the needs are greatest and also understanding how to plan for the future. We've heard a lot about trusting charities in this panel today. I think that phrase has come up um, several times. And I, I'm curious for to sort of close out this portion of the conversation, because I do want to get to questions from the audience. Art, um, trusting charities. You're, you know, you you look at charities and you assess whether they they should be trusted or what should be trusted and what they should be trusted to do. So any final word on on you know to donors to our listeners here about charities trusting them and wanting to make a difference on the ground well trust is the key currency in our work i mean you we can't do anything if people don't trust the organization so we certainly want to encourage people to trust because we know that if people trust they give more but there's also trustworthiness and not every organization that is trusted is trustworthy. So I think it's important for every organization to do what's possible, given the situation, to demonstrate their trustworthiness. And as I said before, one of, them, one of the key things is to try to do what you say you're going to do. That's one of the most critical things you can do. And if at some point you can't do that, you need to let people know, and that maintains the trust. And I think, you know, we're at a point where certainly the larger organizations have baked in systems and communications teams 
who do this as part of their normal work. This isn't something that is a stretch for organizations to have to do. They, they have that built in. It's part of their operation and they do it well. So um, it's really important because again, um, we want people giving joyfully. We want people giving confidently. We want people giving knowing that they actually have a chance to succeed uh, with their gift. And I think organizations can do a little bit of work here and many of them do, and it goes a long way in maintaining, I think, the trust that people have in those organizations. I said a final question before we went to the audience, but I, I do have one final question. I'm gonna take my, moderate, my moderator's prerogative here. What shouldn't people do? Um, there, there are ways to do harm when trying to do good. And I just pose this to the panel as a final, a final question before we go to the audience. Is there anything that you would advise against that's more harmful than useful in Ukraine? Thank you for asking that question. I was so ready to answer this question <laughs> in our prep. Um, well, in disasters, cash over stuff and unrestricted giving over restricted giving. That's the, the basic formula. Um, the other thing too, and, and Art may want to speak to this as well, is that we're well beyond the point where people ought to be using the, the um, artificial idea of an overhead ratio. Sure. as a way of determining uh, effective giving. Uh, there, the, this is an area actually where the academic research is really helping because we're starting to formulate a really good argument about how much uh, non-programmatic expend expenditures are related to high-performing nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, and lower overhead is not a better organization. Um, so the, the other thing, and if I can just, every disaster is contextual. So if I can just add one more thought, I'm really struck right now by the fact that um, everybody in the room can't reach some of the people who need help right now. We're in the middle of a military conflict. And so I'm looking for organizations right now that are really making a connection between humanitarian law and what they do as charities, because um, we, we ought to be pressing um, the, those who can make these decisions to open up humanitarian quarters and help us get aid to the people who, who need it. Yeah. Anybody else want to want to give a what not to do harmful practices? I guess I, I mean I think it ties a, a bit you know very much I think Beth gave gave a great overview and you know to touch a bit on on what Art had said a bit the trust and the trust based philanthropy and I do think there's a certain aspect of you've you've researched these organizations and the same you know you think about it like a fire department I think people often they think they know better than the organizations on the ground who've been working in this crisis or working with these individuals and they, they'll want to tell you this is what you should be doing. And I would say, okay, in the same way you have a fire department and, and you know, if your house is on fire, you'd love if all your neighbors show up with buckets of water, but let's be honest, you want the fire department and the charities who work in these conflict settings, they're the fire department. They are trained and aware and an understanding of the complexities of the security issues, of the sanctions, of, of how to try and access these populations, of how to try and be principled in the way Beth was saying, that humanitarian principled approach that's really looking at international law. Those organizations, they, they, they need your support not to tell them what to do, but to understand that they, they, they have an expertise and to believe in that expertise. And you, you know, again, you might wanna do your research, find one that really aligns with you in the way that Art was saying, the way Beth has highlighted, but definitely trust, not just them in terms of the finances, but trust their expertise. Um, and I, I think that's where you get the, oh, but I wanna give canned goods. Well, trust when they're telling you no, believe them, there's a reason um, why they're saying no. Very true. And if I could uh, augment to that, because I, I do think that what naturally flows from that is a trust that um, these organizations are also, to some extent, especially local ones, able to operate in a, in a more informal manner. Um, and they may not necessarily be able to report out on exactly what they're doing because it would put them at risk. And so this appreciation for um, trusting those teams um, and letting them do their work uh, and you know, funding them in such a way that they're able to then support those communities. Um, and then you know, as they're able to, and as it makes sense that they can um, come back and, and you know, provide those um, report outs as, as needed. Thanks. So I, I wanted, um, I have 
two questions from the audience that I think I want to combine into sort of one broader question, and, and I'll pose it to whoever really wants to answer this question because it's a big one. Um, one question is the is the US government spending in Ukraine going where it needs to go and will it help the humanitarian situation? And the other question was, will Ukraine need a Marshall Plan? after the war is over. And I think that those questions uh, basically get at the same issue, which is, is the US government go engaging currently or going to engage in a way that is actually um, enormously helpful to people on the ground? Is the money getting where it needs to go? What do you guys see from the perspective as humanitarian aid people looking at government spending in the country now and later? And we have, I should say, just a few minutes. <laughs> I mean, I, I could take a crack at it. I think, you know, the, the attention is that the government's putting on things that only governments can do. And that's the national security dimension, which, I mean, direct relief doesn't deal with. You see the effects when it fails. But I think that's appropriate. I think, again, the big, those big wheels of it, will there be a Marshall Plan or not? I don't know. We've been spending a lot of money at the governmental level on everything. So I think but something that only the government can do at scale is the armaments and the kind of stuff that's clearly the priority of the Ukrainian people. They're trying to save their country. So, uh, you know, it's, I think it's too early to tell. I think the desire is there. Uh, whether the money will be there, if we'll get bogged down in politics is unclear. But um, I think in the near term, there's a, a huge, uh, huge need that's uh, not being met. Philanthropic dollars can make a big difference now. It's uh, a little premature to try to forecast how this thing's gonna shake out in my view, because, um, we haven't seen this in modern history. And uh, the last time we did, it was a brutally long shakeout, but, but things have changed. So I'll defer to people who are more thoughtful and experienced than myself on that one. But I think that's the government's role at the US level is probably where it can do the most good for now, because even the aid programs are a bit slow getting going. Those big wheels take a bit to set up at the governmental level. Anyone else? We have three minutes left to, to answer that question, or if that feels too big, we can ask another question from the audience. For me, I think it is, it's just what I'd said earlier. It's an ecosystem. We need everybody to contribute to this. This crisis is going gonna, is gonna to go on for a while. And unfortunately, the recovery will take a long time and it's going to take all types of dollars. And that that means, you know, there is there is money going in from the U.S. government through the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. There's money going in through Department of State's population, refugee migration. That money then is programmed out to organizations on the ground um, in the same way that philanthropic dollars are programmed out to organizations on the ground. So I think, you know, it's going to take all of us in terms of that. And as Thomas said, you know, there's a quite a bit of funding going in for other, you know, political, military, economic needs that nonprofits may have opinions on, but to be honest, we try and stay out of that uh, that world in, in a large way because we don't want to be aligned too much with any one government's positioning. It, it, create, it can create trouble for organizations on the ground in terms of, as Sandrina said, their operating environment, their space, their security, their safety. So I do think that you know we need to speak out about what's happening. We need to call for attention. We need to call for funding. Uh, but uh, how much is going in, I think only, only time can tell um, and where this actually ends up. Thanks. I'm going to take one last question from the audience. I apologize to people who sent in their questions. There were a lot of good ones and we only had one hour. So there's two minutes left for this question. Is there evidence that giving to Ukraine is squeezing out other important causes or are people just digging deeper for this crisis? Um, I'll, I'll let whoever wants to have the last word answer well, that one. Just a quick mention that in prior research on disaster philanthropy, that doesn't seem to be the fact that there's a growing out effect. So you're saying in general, people just dig deeper and, and they give more. There's not a, um, a choice being made between A and B. Yeah, that's what prior research says with all the caveats we already mentioned regarding the scope of the prior research. Catesby, there, there is very, normally philanthropy is not incredibly generous, generous into complex humanitarian emergencies. Um, you know, very much so in, in, in disasters from natural hazards, but in complex humanitarian emergencies where there's this protracted nature, where there's no real clear event that ends and people know they give, the giving has always been on the slower, smaller side. So I would say that there's, it's less taking from others, but maybe more a clarion call of, hey, we actually should give more into these complex humanitarian emergencies in future. And so in some ways from CDP, our positioning is, 
does this set us up to actually have a greater narrative to pull more people into the tent of giving into complex emergencies? If you've done it in Ukraine, why not give to Tigray? Why not give to Myanmar? Why not give to other places? And I, all, okay. all I would add to that really quickly is that we've seen a decline in giving overall, the number of people giving, not the total amounts. We've seen a decline in the number of people giving. And you know, we're, we can always be hopeful that when people see these kinds of events, that will pull some of them back into the world of giving. Um, we've seen just a, a huge loss in the numbers of families giving over the years. And you know, maybe this, these kinds of events can, can stimulate a different thinking about what organizations can do if um, we give them the resources. That's a nice, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut it off here, guys. It's the end of our hour, but I, I like ending on that sort of optimistic note in the middle of this very desperate situation that you guys are all working really hard to try to address. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Um, to the listeners, many of the organizations that are represented here, their websites are resources for those who want to give. They, they um, have a lot of information, so I encourage you if you're interested in giving and following the advice here to, to look into some of the organizations that folks um, lead here on this panel and hopefully that can help guide you in your quest to support Ukraine and beyond. Glenn, any final words? Uh, no, I thank you, Catesby, for moderating such an exciting panel. I want to thank all the panelists for uh, for being here. I know it's a busy time and I want to thank you for all you do. And I did just want to mention to people wondering where Nick, where Nate went, um, Nate Mook had, had to go to the White House. So we're like, well, okay, you can, I, I guess that's a little important. So, um, but I wanted to thank him for his time as well. And, and thank you all of you for coming. Uh, we're having these uh, panel discussions pretty much every month or two. So, um, please uh, sign up for the newsletter and uh, look out for uh, upcoming uh, events. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. <clears throat>